Hello everyone, my name is Akash Kumar Sengupta and today I'll be talking about strong algebras and radical Sylvester Galai configurations. This is joint work with Rafael Oliveira and this is the video presentation for our paper at Stock 2024 conference. So let's get started. The outline of the talk is going to be the following. First, I'll talk about Sylvester Galai configurations and radical Sylvester Galai configurations, which is the main object of study in our paper and our main result and our motivation and applications towards polynomial entity testing. Okay. So the story goes back to 1893, where Sylvester asked this question that, let's say we have finite number of points inside of R2, and let's say the set of points satisfies the following property that the line joining any two points from our set contains a third point from our set. Okay. So for example, draw this line, there's a third point. And again, if you draw another line joining two points from our set, there should be another point on that. And Sylvester asked, does this mean that all the points of F have to be on the same line? Yeah. And this question was also independently asked by Adosh, and the answer turns out to be yes, and it was answered by Melchior and Galai independently. The crucial thing here is that we are dealing with a finite set of points. For an infinite set of points, I could keep going on and have a non-linear co configuration, but all the, all the points are not necessarily on the same line, um, but um, the finiteness of the set of points constrains the configuration to be on the same line. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, even more is true in higher dimensions inside of Rn, no matter how large the dimension of the ambient space is, as long as the set of points satisfies the same condition, all of them have to be collinear. So the takeaway here is that the affine dimension is at most one. They're all on a line. And the dimension of the vector space span of all our points inside Rn, that is at most two dimension. Okay, so that is that is the result which is known as the sylvester Galai theorem. Okay. And ever since, there have been various vari variants and numerous generalizations, such as linear colored robust sylvester Galai configurations, which I'll talk a little bit about soon. Um, but the general principle behind all of these sylvester Galai type theorems is the following. So the way we can view sylvester Galai configurations is that it's a finite set of geometric objects which have some local constraints. Yeah, And the sylvester Galai type theorems, they always have the common theme which says that these sylvester Galai type configurations are always low dimension. So we can think of these results as some kind of local to global principle in some way where local constraints give rise to global constraints. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what are the classical and some recent Sylvester Galai type theorems in the linear Sylvester Galai type world. Okay. So in all of these theorems, there'll be an ambient space and finite set of geometric objects in there and some local constraints and the global bounds which we get out of the theorems. So if our ambient space is Rn, we take a bunch of points in Rn and the local constraint is exactly what we described right now, that for any pair of points i and j, pi, pj, there's a third point pk, which is in the line joining pi and pj. And the theorem we just saw, it told us that the affine dimension is at most one. So that's the global dimension bound. Similarly, if we are in a complex vector space Cn and the geometric objects are finite set of vectors inside of Cn and the local constraint, suppose it is span dependency, that whenever I take two vectors Vi and Vj, there is a third vector Vk, which is in the span of Vi, Vj. Yeah? And even then, the Sylvester Galai type theorem shows us that there is a global dimension bound of three. This, no matter how large the ambient space Cn was, all these points have to be inside of a three dimensional subspace. And this result was proven by Kelly and which depends on deep results in algebraic geometry, which was uh, discovered in the work of Hirzebruch. Okay, let's go ahead. And similarly in Cn, there is a version of fractional Sylvester Galai where this fractional condition says that maybe we don't need to have the local dependency 
or all pairs. So given any i, there is a delta fraction of the rest of the vectors, vj's, so that for those pairs vi, vj, there is a vk in the span. Yeah. So with this fractional local dependence condition, even then there is a global dimension bound, which of course depends on the delta fraction that we are using. So depending on the parameter delta, there is still a bound. And this was done in the work of Barak, David, Victor, Sen, and Yehudi. Okay. Right. Okay, and one last one. So in Rn, let's take again a finite set of vectors and the local constraint now is going to be a, a colored Sylvester Gallai condition. So let's see what that looks like. So our set F is partitioned into three subsets, red, blue, green, or the first color, second color, third color. And the dependence is whenever I take, let's say a red vector and a blue vector, there is a green vector in their span or whenever I take, take a vector with the first color and, and a vector with the second color, then there's a third vector of the third color, which is in their span. Yeah, this is for any pair of distinct colors. This is the colored Sylvester Gallai configuration. And even then we have a global dimension bound of three, and this is the classical edelstein kelly theorem. Okay. So there are all these Sylvester Gallai type theorems and they have found numerous applications in computer science, for example, to polynomial test algorithms and coding theory. Okay. So how can we summarize all these theorems? As we discussed that, you know, all these theorems, they have a finite set of geometric objects with some local constraints. And the thing to note here is all the results we saw, all the local constraints were some kind of linear dependence. Yeah. But all the theorems told us that the configuration is low dimensional or they depend on low number of variables. And the thing to note here is that the bound on the dimension of the span of F does not depend on the number of variables we had, the, the dimension of the ambient space doesn't depend on the cardinality of the set. And it's also most of the times independent of the field. Um, this is something we are going to discuss more later. All right. So what we do in our work is study nonlinear Sylvester Gallai configurations where the local dependencies are not necessarily linear algebraic. They are nonlinear. In particular, they are more commutative algebraic or algebraic geometric dependencies. And the main questions we are concerned with are that are these Sylvester Gallai type configurations always low dimensional with these nonlinear dependencies? Okay. And what are some applications of nonlinear SG theorems? Okay. okay. So just to summarize what is coming ahead, our work is that in the similar theme, the ambient space we are going to consider is the polynomial ring. Yeah. And the finite set of geometric objects we are going to consider, the objects will be irreducible homogeneous polynomials and geometrically they're zero sets. So that's the finer set of geometric objects. And the local constraint that we're going to put is something called radical dependence. So I'll explain what that means. In summary, it means that whenever I pick one polynomial Fi from my set, another polynomial Fj from my set, they're distinct. Then if Fi and Fj vanish on an input, then th there's a third polynomial which always vanishes on all those common zeros of Fi and Fg. Yeah. So this is a little bit similar to the condition we saw earlier, but this is more geometric and we'll discuss the algebraic analog of this soon. So in this context, we can again ask, are there global bounds? Can we say that these polynomials maybe depend on low number of variables or they should be low dimensional? And this is exactly what our work addresses. And that's the main result I'll be talking about. So let's go ahead and let's formally define what these radical Sylvester Gallai configurations are, and then we'll discuss how it relates to polynomial and G-test. So the setting is as follows. Let's fix D, which is some positive integer, and let's take the polynomial ring in N variables, which is arbitrarily large number of variables. We don't really care. And a finite set of irreducible forms, meaning homogeneous polynomials, we're going to say that there are D radical SG configurations if their degree is bounded by D, so utmost degree D polynomials, and they satisfy the following conditions. So 
if I have any two distinct for i and j, if i is not equal to j, then fi is not a scalar multiple of fj. Yeah. And for any two distinct fi fjs, there's a third polynomial fk from our set so that the common zero set of fi fj is contained in the zero set of fk. Yeah. So th let's explain this notation. V of fk is the zero set of fk. And V of Fi Fj is the common zeros of Fi and Fj. Yeah, so this is some kind of, this is an algebraic variety inside of the space Cn. Yeah, and what this condition translates to is that if Fi and Fj vanish on an input, then the third polynomial Fk always vanishes Yeah, on all those inputs. So let's think about this condition that V on the leftmost side at the bottom, line we have v of fi fj is a subset of v of fk yeah so equivalently what this geometric condition translates to is an algebraic condition which is this equation that some power of fk can be expressed as polynomial a times fi plus some polynomial b times fg yeah so the first equivalence comes from Hilbert's non stellingers So depending whether you prefer the geometric interpretation or the algebraic interpretation, you can think of either of these two conditions. And this these two conditions are summarized as the third one here, that Fk is in the radical of Fifg. Yeah? So the radical condition is a nonlinear dependence. That's why it's a nonlinear Sylvester-like configuration. Yeah? And furthermore, what is this radical? So the radical of FIFJ is the set of all polynomials F, so that some power can be expressed as A times FI plus B times FG. Yeah, so this is an object well studied in algebraic geometry and commutative algebra and also in computer science. And, that, and this radical dependence is the local dependence that we will be considering for our finite set of homogeneous polynomials, yeah. Okay, so the main conjecture of interest here was a conjecture of Gupta in 2014 that there exists a function lambda so that whenever I take a D radical Sylvester Galley configuration, the dimension is upper bounded by lambda of D. Yeah, so if you go back here, you see that the D is what determines the degree of the polynomials in my configuration. And there is a uniform bound on the on the vector space span depending only on the degree D. That's the conjecture, okay? And when D is equal to one, we're just looking at homogeneous linear polynomials. And by duality, this is equivalent to the classical sylvester Galai theorem. So this can be proved using some algebra and some um, geometry. So we can prove it that this is equivalent to the classical Sylvester Galai theorem that we saw in the table. So d equal to one case is classical. The d equal to two case was proven by Amir Spilka in 2019, and d equal to three was done by Olivier and myself in 2022. Okay. And the main result that I'm talking about today is the solution to this conjecture in general that indeed there exists a function lambda so that this lambda of d uniformly upper bounds the dimension of span of d radical Sylvester Galley configurations. Yeah. So let's interpret this theorem for a second. What is the takeaway here? Is that you know I had some polynomial ring, maybe in million number of variables over some algebraically closed field, say, and I had a Sylvester Galley configuration where the degree of the polynomials was at most d. Yeah, and the dependence was the radical dependence. Under these conditions, the dimension of the span of these polynomials is upper bounded by a function only of D, and it doesn't matter what field we were over, how many variables we had in the polynomial ring, and how many polynomials we started with. Okay, so that's the content of this theorem, essentially. And what does this achieve? So first of all, this fully resolves Gupta's first conjecture in Gupta's series of conjectures. And the series of conjectures Gupta made were in order to get polynomial time algorithms for the PIT problem, which I'll talk about. And our result establishes the first step in the Gupta series of conjectures and fully resolves the first conjecture, which was the kind of the building block towards getting the 
uh, further conjectures, which is still open and ongoing work. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, about our motivation, which is polynomial identity testing. So, so in algebraic complexity theory, we are concerned with efficient computation of polynomials. And the model we use is an algebraic model of computation, which is an arithmetic circuit. So which looks something like this, you have some input gates, which are some variables or scalars, and then you combine with addition multiplication gates, and then it spits out some polynomial. Yeah? So this is a circuit which is computing this specific polynomial in front of us. Okay, and the size of this circuit is the number of edges. And what does the PIT problem ask for? It asks the following, that let's say we are given an arithmetic circuit and maybe we have black box access to this circuit and, and the circuit computes some polynomial P and the problem, the PIT problem asks us to find a deterministic algorithm that tests whether this circuit was computing the identically zero polynomial or not, yeah? And we should only use polynomial in the size of C number of computations. Yeah. And we are thinking that doing addition multiplication of the field elements, it costs us one unit. So for example, a circuit might spit out this polynomial in front of us, right? X times X plus Y minus X, Y minus X square. But this is actually the zero polynomial. So this is the kind of thing we want to test. And there are efficient randomized algorithms. We can evaluate at random inputs and do this very efficiently. But the question is, are there efficient deterministic algorithms? And so far, there are no known polynomial time deterministic algorithms which work for general circuits. Okay, so that's the main problem. All right. And we might ask, that, okay, we have randomized algorithms. What's the point of trying to get deterministic algorithms? It is actually, this PIT problem is very central to algebraic complexity theory and computer science in general. Um, and this is one of the most important problems to de-randomize PIT. And if we have a complete de-randomization, then the work of Cabanez and Inpagliazzo shows us that we can explicitly construct hard polynomials, which almost solves VP versus VNP, which is the algebraic analog of P versus NP. And there are also many other applications to perfect matching. For example, the famous primary testing algorithm goes via doing PIT for certain kind of polynomials, not for general circuits. Okay, so that's our motivation for studying the PIT problem. Um, let's do an example and see how the PIT problem relates to Sylvester-like configurations. Yeah, so let's consider for a minute these depth three circuits, which are very low depth circuits. So essentially a depth three circuit computes a polynomial P, which looks like this, product of linear forms, plus product of linear forms, plus product of linear forms, yeah, where we have, let's say, D money linear forms in each product, yeah, and all of them are linear forms. And if you're interested in testing, whether this polynomial was identically zero. So maybe if you want to devise an algorithm, let's try to understand what would happen if it was identically zero. Can we extract some kind of structure of these constituent linear forms? Yeah. So if P was identically zero, then this sum of products is equal to zero. So the idea of the and Spilka was that let's think of these linear forms as being a set of colored linear forms. So bunch of vectors, which are the first AI linear forms, we let's say if the first color or red color, second color or, or green color or third color or blue color. So when we color it like this, then let's think about this. If this equation holds that this sum of products is zero, then whenever I have an input so that AI and BJ vanish, then the product of CIs must vanish. Right? So hence, one of the CK must vanish. Right? And this condition actually turns out to be equivalent to the colored Sylvester-like condition. Yeah? So this vanishing condition of linear forms essentially tells us that one of the CK must be in the span of AIBJ vectors. When we think of these linear forms as vectors inside of the polynomial ring, yeah? which is a vector space over the field. Yeah? So this problem 
if the circuit was computing a zero polynomial, then the constituent polynomials form a colored sylvester galai configuration. And by the classical sylvester galai theorem that we talked about, the colored version, it tells us that they depend on only at most three variables. And we can use this fact to design efficient PIT algorithms. Yes, this is just a toy example to give us an idea how these two things are connected and how Sylvester Galley configurations are useful towards getting PIT algorithms. Yeah. In general, given a circuit, you would think of whether the constituent polynomials are some kind of Sylvester Galley configuration or not. If not, we can do some efficient deterministic algorithm. And if yes, then you need to study Sylvester Galley configurations. And the dimension bounds will help us get PIT algorithms. Okay, so that's the whole idea. Okay, so if we go to depth four circuits for which we still don't know polynomial time algorithms in general, and then those linear forms will be replaced by possibly higher degree forms. And we can think of a similar thing if a polynomial P was identically zero and P had this expression, that it's a product of AIs plus product of BIs plus product of CJs, and they are possibly higher degree polynomials now. And these kind of circuits are the depth four circuits. And actually the result of Agarwal when I shows us that if we can get polynomial time PIT for these kind of circuits, then we can get quasi poly time PIT for general circuits essentially. So that's why this is important. And now we can play the same game. If AI and VJ vanish on input, then the product of CIs must vanish, right? And by Hilbert's non Stellenzatz, this tells us that we have a nonlinear some kind of dependency, which is that the product of CIs must belong to the radical of the ideal AI and BG. So that's how this radical condition naturally emerges when we look at depth four circuits. Okay. And so let's think about how will this help get PIT. So this was in particular addressed in the work of Gupta, where Gupta made a series of conjectures. So first conjecture was the D-radical Sylvester Galai conjecture that we talked about, right? We described the conjecture. And the conjecture two is a product version of this Sylvester Galai conjecture. And conjecture three is a colored version where we have K number of colors. So our polynomials are partitioned into K colors and we still have a product radical dependence condition. And if we have the third conjecture, then Gupta proved that the third conjecture will give us polytime deterministic PIT for depth four circuits. Yeah. And which will in turn give us quasi polytime for general circuits. Okay. So, so this is the series of conjectures Gupta made. And what our work, Oliveira and myself, addresses is the first conjecture. That's the result we talked about. And what are the key ingredients? So what we do is we establish a new connection between these Sylvester Galai configurations and something called Stillman uniformity phenomenon in commutative algebra and algebraic geometry. Yeah. So there have been some recent breakthroughs in commutative algebra about uniform bounds on ideals and their complexities and their and their invariants. And what we do is we relate Sylvester Galai configurations with these kind of Stillman uniformity principles. And what turns out that those principles are not directly enough to yield the theorem we want, but we build upon those techniques and develop them further with applications to PIT and computer science in mind. Okay, And the main tool is the theory of strong algebras which is part of our title, the strong algebras in there. So strong algebras are essentially sub-algebras of the polynomial ring, which are generated by some homogeneous polynomial G1 up to Gs. And the one of the key properties of these algebras is that the generators of the algebra, they themselves behave like variables. They might not be variables in our polynomial ring, but they are strong enough to behave like variables. And that strength of these algebras helps us um, apply various algebraic geometric techniques and tools from commutative algebra to bound the dimension of Sylvester Galai configurations. Yeah. And so I will not go into the details of how our proof works, but that's essentially two key things which are um, technical innovations and contributions of our work. And in summary, what it gives us is new tools to study configurations of polynomials. Yeah. Okay, and so the first conjecture we solved it in our work, 
which is part of this presentation. And Conjecture 2 is work in progress with Aviva Garg, Rafael Oliveira, and myself. And Conjecture 3 is still open. And if we are able to prove Conjecture 3, then we will have polytime PIT for depth force circuits. And I should add, this is with constant top and bottom fan in. So we, you see this K and D in this circuit. So that we will keep fixed. And depth four with constant top and bottom fan. So we can get polytime PIT if we get a colored version with product structure for the result we just talked about. Okay. All right, thank you.